in uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, he said in verse uh, 1, Hebrews 2, 1, so therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Put up the Amplified, please. Said, since all this is true, we ought to pay much closer attention than ever to the truths which we have heard, lest in any way we drift past them and slip away. The New American says, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Now the Lord's not leaving us, but you can leave Him. His Word won't fail you, but you can leave His Word. There are no God-ordained failures. <laughs> I know people try to make stuff out to be. But if you look at the whole thing and you can say categorically it was a failure, it wasn't God. It wasn't God. Uh, our title of the series has been Pay Attention. <laughs> pay Attention. And why do we need to pay? Does the Bible tell us to pay attention? It does. And why would we need to? We went into some detail last uh, Friday about how it's not that God is hiding things from us and withholding things from us. It's not that His things are so complicated and hard to understand and we're so dull and dumb that we can't get it. it it's where we are. We're in a dark place spiritually. Now we we don't realize it because we were born into this, and this is all we've ever known, but this is a cursed, dark, oppressive existence. <laughs> I know people try to, they talk about, you know, this, this is heaven. It is not. <laughs> people say, oh, people are searching for heaven, and here it is right here on earth. You can experience days of heaven on the earth, but no honey child, this ain't heaven. Not even close. Uh-uh. God created the heavens and the earth perfect. When he beheld his creation brand new, still the steam still coming off of it. <laughs> He looked at everything and said, Behold, it is very good. Can you look at cancer and AIDS and say, Behold, it is very good? You can't. There was none of that in God's original creation. Can you look at the cruelty and atrocities that men committed against each other and the crimes and say, Behold, that's very good? Uh -uh. There was no sin. There was no curse. There was no death. That's right. There was no sorrow. There was no depression. There was no crying. Now, we don't know a world like that because it, it had changed by the time we got here. When Adam and Eve sinned, the earth was cursed and death permeates this place. And Satan, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, is now the God of this world. When during the temptation in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, when he told Jesus, he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give all this to you. Because it's mine. It was delivered to me and I can give it to whoever I want to. The devil said that. Somebody said, he's lying. He couldn't have been lying about all of it or it wouldn't have been a temptation. Wouldn't the Lord have known? Hmm? Wouldn't the Father have revealed to him if it was a lie? No, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords and all these kingdoms are to become his. That's, what, that's who he is and the enemy is trying to get him to take a shortcut. 
Don't need to go to the cross. Don't need to do all that. Just worship me and Zappo. It's all yours. <laughs> he said, you get behind me. You worship the Lord your God. He's quoting scripture. Worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. But I'm just elaborating that the earth, now even in its fallen, cursed state, you still see remnants of its beauty. How amazing it must have been, we really don't know. The Bible said the waters were above and below the firmament. Uh, you wouldn't have even got radiation from the sun like you do today. There's a reason why in the beginning people are living seven, eight, nine hundred years before they died. Because <laughs> we, we were not designed to die. But because of sin, death entered in, and death passed upon all men, for that all is sin, Romans said. Oh, but thank God, sin has been dealt with. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus took it. He bore it, and all that believe on him receive the power and authority to become the sons of God. And if you read the back of the book, there's coming a time very soon when it's all going to be restored. This one can't be fixed. People say, well, uh, you, know, you know, let's save the planet. Ultimately, the planet cannot be saved. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The, the crust of this planet is going to melt. Something's going to happen to our sun. You can read about it in Revelation. And it's going to be gone. And the Lord is going to create new heavens. That's a new atmosphere. Our atmosphere is going to be gone. But he's going to create new heavens and new earth. And in this new heavens and earth, there is no curse. We've never been in a place like that. <laughs> that means you can run through the jungle barefoot and never get a briar. Or a tick. And if you see a lion, you can grab him and wrestle with him. <laughs> or tell him to do a trick for you. <laughs> We've never been in a place like that. And originally, animals were not supposed to rip each other apart. That's part of the curse. It's all part of the curse. But... Being in this environment, there is this pressure to prevent us from receiving the Word of God and understanding it. And in order to get it, you have to develop powers of concentration. And you have to make up your mind that you're not going to be distracted by what you're seeing and hearing and feelings and emotions and everybody else's stuff that's going on with them. And you have to do what the Bible said in Proverbs 4. He said, Proverbs 4, 1, this is the NIV. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. Verse 20, my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Why would he need to tell you that? Why would it need to say repeatedly, pay attention, pay close attention, listen closely, keep it in front of your, word, in, in front of your eyes, uh, keep it in your heart, don't let it get away from you. Why would, he, why would he say that? Because there are forces at work where we live right now to keep you from getting it. Um. This is true with all ministry, but I'll just, I, I don't know about everybody else's ministry. I can tell you about mine a little bit. Uh, I've, there have been places, every time I minister, to me, I take it very seriously. It's very important to me. Uh, then there are times you can tell this, this is a body of Christ changing word. 
This is a, if I'm out on the road, this is a church changing word. This is a future for these people changing word. Not something I came up with. And there have been times when I've been in my hotel room. And if I'm ministering somewhere out on the road, I don't sightsee. Usually don't even go out to eat. I stay in there all day and wait on the Lord and pray and get quiet. And study and focus on it, focus on it. And there have been times the Lord started giving me something. And I can tell, this is a church changing word. This is, and at times like that, I can, if, if I let, it, let my attention and focus, you know, trail off the least little bit, it's gone from me. Now, have you, have you ever had the Lord tell you something? And it was so good and it was so real to you and you thought you'd never forget it. And 15 minutes later, couldn't remember what it was. I don't even have to ask you. I know it's true with every one of you in here. Why? Well, it's not because God took it away from you. It's not because you can't understand it. It's because when the sower sows the word, the enemy comes immediately to, to steal it. To take it out. How can he do that? If he can get you to turn it loose. To focus on something else. Even for a second or two. Can you see this? Yes. And so, and, and there have been times I've been speaking to a group of ministers or to a, a you know, conference. I'm, I'm thinking of one right now. It was a bunch of people there and it was a, it was a doctrinal issue. And people were, churches were splitting over it. And I, I, I don't wade off into that on my own. <laughs> I'd rather leave it alone. But if the Lord is with you to do it, lives are in the balance. And so as I was doing it, I could tell, man, it, I was having to so concentrate. Because if I, would, if I would relax my concentration a little bit, I, I wouldn't know what I was talking about. Why? It's not because I was having a bad day. It's because the enemy does not want these people to hear this and get this and understand. Why? Because the truth will make you free. It will make you free. It will show up his lies. It will reveal his tactics and his activities and it will set you free. Well, that works on both sides. Not only on the ministering side, but on the hearing side. That's right. That's right. <laughs> if the Lord's talking to you about something and it's an answer and you know it is, brace up. Mm -hmm. Make up your mind, I'm getting this. Mm -hmm. And do not let yourself be distracted mm -hmm. or deterred or pulled off. Does that make sense, friends? Yes. Why else would he keep saying, pay attention. Mm -hmm. keep, keep this in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. Keep it in your heart. Hold fast what you have. Why all these statements? Why? Because in the world we live in, all kind of stuff around us is trying to steal it from us. Trying to keep the enemy can rule over and dominate those who are ignorant and in darkness. And he wants to dominate this whole planet. And the, the more ignorant you are of God's Word, I'm not talking about you may have several degrees, but if you're ignorant of God's Word, He can dominate you. You'll believe all kinds of stuff. He can control you. Oh, but once the entrance of His Word gives light, and you lay hold of it and make up your mind, you're going to believe this, you're going to do this, you don't care what anybody else does. The enemy loses his grip. He loses his hold. Just like that. Say it out loud, the truth, the truth. Will, will make you free. Make you free yes. Thank you, Lord. Uh, go with me, please, to uh, Hebrews, the third chapter. And I want us to, to get into some tonight. Why many don't pay attention. If you should, okay, that's good. But many don't. There have been times you haven't. 
There's been times I haven't. Why didn't we? Why don't people pay attention? You want to talk about that some? Hebrews 3 and verse 7. Hebrews 3 and 7, wherefore he said, as the Holy Ghost says, today, if you'll what? If you will hear his voice. So who's it up to whether you hear his voice or not? The if comes back to us. If you'll hear it. Verse 8, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Skip down to verse 15. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Somebody said out loud, harden not your hearts. Go to the fourth chapter in the seventh verse. He brings it up again. 4-7 of Hebrews. He said, uh, saying in David, today after so long a time as it is said, today, if you'll what? If you will hear his voice, what? Harden not your hearts. Why don't folks pay attention? One reason, not the only reason, one reason that people don't pay attention is because they don't consider it important. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't consider it important. You and I in here tonight and in Branson and those joining us online, we are, compared to the billions of people on the planet, a very small minority yeah. that are here in church on a Friday night mm -hmm. wanting to hear the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. What percentage of the billions on the planet are we? <laughs> Because there are millions of Christians who could be here with us and in places like this, churches and ministries like this, all over the world tonight, but they're not. Why? They don't see it as that important. Something else is more important in their life. And they don't realize it. But if the Lord didn't deal with them to do it, it's vain. Or they might get a little pleasure out of it. They might get a little money out of it. But if he told you to, to go to church or he told you to get in the meeting, in probably hours or days or weeks or months, nobody's going to know about it. Nobody's going to care and then what's going to happen? Something's going to come up or already is in their life. You're going to need that faith. You're going to need that word and you're not going to have it. But it'll be their fault that they don't have it because the Lord dealt with them to get it and they had the opportunity to get it but did not. And people will suffer because of ignorance. But it will be their fault. Because if they'd have done what he said, they wouldn't be ignorant. We say it and everybody laughs, but when we say, uh, there's a saying around here, no cost means no excuse. No excuse for not knowing it. You can't say I couldn't uh, afford it. So if you knew about it, and you didn't, the answer was in there. We spent the time, we spent the money, uh, everybody involved in the ministry, everybody on the teams did their part. We had the service. The word came out, the anointing was there. And it was your answer. But you had something more important to do and you didn't do it. And so you didn't know it. You think, well, I didn't know it. Yeah, but <laughs> if you'd listened, if you'd have paid attention, right? You'd have been there. Now, no need to yield any condemnation. All of us have made some mistakes in these areas. And, and the more you do it, the more it costs you. But could you make a change and begin to put his things first? 
priorities. His Word should be priority in our life. What He says about everything should take the preeminence above what we, our family, our friends, our co-workers think or say or do. True or not? If Jesus is your Lord, His Word is first place in your life. This simply is not the case with millions of Christians. And we'll talk about it in just a moment further. Uh, where are you? Yeah, just put up on the screen for us, please, Hosea 4 and 4. Hosea 4, 4. He said, uh, well, let, let's just look at verse 6 for time's sake. This is a much quoted verse. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Have you heard that verse quoted yes. before? And I, I, this was a, a strong one I quoted in the early days of my ministry, and I stopped right there. People are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I thought the biggest problem is people don't know. That's the biggest problem, is all this ignorance. Lack of knowledge of God, lack of knowledge of Jesus, lack of knowledge of salvation. On and on, that's the big problem. And several years later, I realized that ain't the biggest problem. And I read the rest of the verse. <laughs> what did he say? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have what? You have rejected knowledge. The, the biggest problem is not that people have never heard. Many have heard. They didn't hear it all, but they heard enough to get started. If they'd have received that and endeavored to walk in the light of that, what would have happened? Anybody know what would happen? He'd have given them more. He'd have, I, I don't care if you grew up in a house that was 20 generations idol worship and none of them ever heard the gospel preached. It makes no difference. God's good and He's fair. And even as a child, there would be a spark in you as you looked up in the night sky or you looked at the majestic mountains or the ocean as you breathed the breath of life. There would be a spark in you that realized there is a creator God and he cares about you. And if you don't just knock that down and go, no, but this is our religion. If you say, I believe that, you know what's going to happen next? He's going to show you a little bit more, a little bit more. He will lead that person. I don't care where you are. Lead them to full salvation in Jesus. And if they keep going, they'll get filled with the Spirit. They'll learn about the gifts of the Spirit. They'll learn about healing. They'll learn about all these other things. They'll just keep going and going and going. Mm -hmm. yes. But the moment is no longer important to you. Mm -hmm. Are you turning aside? Well, that's when darkness starts coming over your mind and you don't see anymore. Uh, go with me, please, to Proverbs. Why don't many pay attention? Do you remember? Not important. Not important. That's why people get mad, you know, a lot of folks get mad about people like us, you know, having nice buildings and having nice TV stuff and especially an airplane or something like that. They think that's such a waste, such a waste, such a waste because they put no value on the Word of God, none. You know, helping somebody that's poor would be a good thing, but this, this, they consider it junk. People would be better off not hearing it. They don't realize they're disrespecting God himself. Jesus is the Word. Isn't he? He's the Word. Made flesh. I know the change in Phyllis in my life came. I know exactly when it happened. 
when we got revelation through uh, Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry and through Brother Kenneth Copeland's ministry about the significance of the Word of God. I grew up in church. And if you'd asked me, did we respect the Bible? I'd have said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was not your standard for life. It was not the final answer for everything. And I didn't realize that until I started hearing it and seeing the, what these ministers were saying. In, in Proverbs 1 and 7, Proverbs 1 and 7, it says the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge. But what else? Fools do what? Despise. They despise wisdom and instruction. So why don't they pay it? Why aren't they paying attention to it? They despise it. Well, now despise, uh, another term is to lightly esteem. Treat it. People, when we, people hear the word despise, they, they think that you, you, you hate it. Well, that could be despising, but it could, despising a thing can be as simple as ignoring it. You're treating it like it's nothing. But you don't even begin to have the knowledge of God until you show some respect. Is everybody listening? which would cause you to see why the world is such a disrespectful place. The God of this world is working overtime to get people to be anything but respectful. It's not just so, you know, he can say, goody, goody, I got you to come down a notch. A lot more is going on. Before you will know there is a God, who he is, what he is, what he has said, what is real, what's not, what's true, what's not, before you'll see any of that. The beginning of knowledge, that's quite a phrase. The beginning of knowing anything. <laughs> huh? Is what? It's not university. People say, well, I've got an extensive education. In what? In what? There's some messed up people behind podiums in classrooms Amen. in universities. Amen. Their lives are a disaster. Mm -hmm. And they're bitter. Mm -hmm. And they're lost. And darkened. Oh, they can use big words. But what does that mean? Well, they have a hardcover book and they got letters after their name. May or may not be worth a thing. According to the Bible, if you believe the Bible, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God. What makes them a fool? Not that they're not intelligent. What makes them a fool? Because you don't begin to know anything until you show God some respect. You will blunder along in darkness and ignorance and waste your life if you don't show him some respect. He will not make you show him respect. He will let you blaspheme him. He will let you ignore him and have no time for him. You short little life. Oh, but if you got any wisdom about you, if you got any understanding about you, you show him respect. You come to him. You acknowledge that the planet you're standing on is because of him. The reason you exist is because of him. Any hope you can have, any good thing you can have is because of him. And show him respect. And don't act like you're talking to somebody who's nothing. Act like you're talking to the creator of the universe. Hmm? I'm not talking about being stuffy and ritualistically dead. I'm just talking about showing respect, showing honor. Hmm? 
He is your father. But who is he? He awesome doesn't begin to tell it. What kind of being can do what he has done? What kind of being? We, we, we have very little idea. Would you like to know more? Yes. How does it come? Come on, help me out. How does it come? People think they're waiting on God. Well, if he wants me to know anything, why don't he show me? You just told us. You have no respect. You talk like that. You act like that. You act like he ain't even real. Jesus said, come learn about me. And what's the thing he brought up? I am meek. He didn't say weak. Meek and lowly of heart. Why? When you realize who he is, you will be too. You plod along, talk the way the world talks, you don't, you don't know who he is. I don't claim to know much about him. But there's a few times I've been in his presence. I felt like a pebble at the base of Mount Everest. <laughs> I felt like a water bubble on top of a blue whale. <laughs> and that don't describe it. I'm, I'm trying looking for, for words. Why? He is so great. He is so big. He could overwhelm us so easily. He could put his face in the sky and everybody would see it from here to China and top to bottom and he could just yell, I am. And the ones that didn't die from fright <laughs> would have their nose pasted to the ground. And he'd, he would, he'd hardly have to do anything. Why didn't he do it? He didn't want to do it. He's not into scaring anybody. That's the enemy who wants to put fear in you. He is light. And he is life. And he is love. And he really does care about you. When you care about somebody, you don't want to scare them out of their wits. <laughs> Right? You don't, you don't want to <laughs> frighten the breath out of them. You, you want to have a conversation with them. Right? You want to fellowship with them. And you can see that's exactly what was going on. When he made his man, he made his woman, what did he do? Came, visited with them. Talked to them. Fellowship with them. Until they disrespected him and ignored what he said. So should they have paid attention to what he said? Yes. And listened to the enemy who's lying to them. Well, you and I face that same dilemma every day. There's a lying devil and all his cohorts and people that are influenced by him. And we live in an ungodly, dark cruel, blaspheming place where disrespect, it's gotten worse. Last 50 years, anybody been around would, would agree with me? It's got, I mean, you used to wouldn't have heard some things relative to God and Jesus. You, people would not have said such things, but it's become acceptable and commonplace. But we must not be conformed to this world. Right. Remember we talked about that last Friday? This is, what, what, what's the result of not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can what? Prove and discern, know what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Amen. People are bumping along, don't know, they, 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 they think they're so brilliant because they say, why are we here? The mystical question. And the implication is nobody can know the most brilliant minds. The simplest child that will show God some respect can know. No. 
You don't have to live in darkness and confusion. And it's not just knowledge. It's experience. The presence of God. If you respect him and love him, he will come into you and come on you in such a way. People can say the junk they want to say. But you know different. You don't think different. You don't hope different. You know. You know different. I remember one of the first times I ever experienced his presence in a strong way. He's, he's everywhere. All the time. But he's not in manifestation. You, you, you don't detect his presence everywhere the same. There are some places you can step off the plane and go, man, this feels like a God forsaken place. It's <laughs> like God ain't been here in centuries. He's there. What's the problem? No respect. No faith. Nobody's yielding to it. And then there are other places, like our places, yes. like your places. Yes. Is that right? Yes. People pull in the driveway and sense the presence of God. Is that right? Come in the building. Hallelujah. Sense the anointing. Sense the Holy Spirit. Come in your house. That was weak. I said, come, come in your house. Hmm? Get in your car. Why? Because you've been praying in there. You've been praising God in there. Presence of God is in there. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But uh, I was a little boy, and uh, my grandmother, who's in heaven now, wonderful woman of God, Sister Lena Pearl Moore. <laughs> Down south, we have double name, good name. Yeah. <laughs> Backup name. In case this one doesn't work, you can use the other one. <laughs> and uh, Sister Lena Pearl, she was the uh, secretary, treasurer, and Sunday school teacher at the uh, Pentecostal church at Cherry Chapel for, I don't know, 40-something years, 50 years. Saw like three generations, you know. Anyway, we'd like to go to her house because she made outstanding tea cakes and rice pudding and other nice things and was just fun to be around. Her and my grandpa and and uh, we lived, we weren't that far from them, a big portion of our life. And, and so uh, one winter uh, night we were staying over there. She gave me a book. I was just old enough to start reading good about a man of God. Actually, a man of God. She was healed in his meeting. And her mother was too. My grandmother my, and my great-grandmother were healed in his meetings. And it was a book about miracles that had happened in his ministry. And I don't know how old I was. I, was, I wasn't a teenager. I was young. And we, I, she sent me back to the blue room to go to bed. And it was cold in there. But she had a fix for it. She piled about eight quilts on top of me. <laughs> and you couldn't hardly turn, but you were warm. You know, you could, when you breathe, you could see your breath up here, but, but you ain't going to freeze. <laughs> when the fire went out, it got cold because those old houses had cracks in them and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I'm sitting up reading this book. And I got to a place where this man, the Lord told him a certain thing was going to happen. And it didn't happen for years, but then he was at a certain place in time, just like he saw when the Lord showed him, and it happened. And a boy was raised from the dead. And I'm reading this story, and this is not fiction now, this is an account of the men. And when I got to that point, the Holy Spirit got into bed with me, <laughs> just as a boy. Got into bed with me. What do you mean, Brother Keith? His presence. I sensed his presence. And I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry or to shout out loud or be real quiet and be still. I didn't know what to do. I knew this is something. I'd never experienced this like this before. Little ones are aware of his presence. 
they get old enough to know right from wrong and choose wrong and they lose that awareness. But uh, I, I knew it was him. I knew it was him. And I, I praised him in there by myself in, that, in the blue room under all the quilts and worshiped him. Why would I talk about it now? It's very real to me now, just like it happened a few days ago. Why? I could have ignored what Grandma said. I'm a kid, right? I could have pitched that book somewhere, <laughs> right? Played or gone to bed or, or whatever. She told me this was important. I respected her. She showed respect for God. So I thought this must be important. If you love God and it's strong enough, people are going to see it and hear it. You're not going to be ashamed to talk about it. If you respect God, you don't, you're not trying to push it down people's throat, but you don't hide it either. I said, you don't hide it either. I said, you don't hide it either. If, if anybody ought to be hiding something, it's folks hiding evil, right? That don't believe in God, not us hiding God. He's real. He's right. So, Mr. Well, everybody has a right to their, their religion. Actually, they don't. I know people say that, politically correct. Well, they're all worshiping the same God with different names. No, they are not. No. Jesus told the Jewish leaders of his day, you are of your father, the devil. The most religious people around there. There's two spiritual families in the earth. Not three, not five, not ten, two. Two. There's the family of God. There's the family of the devil. Not my words. No. People try to be politically correct, don't realize they're believing doctrines of demons that's comforting people in their unbelief. There's a way that seems right to men, and the end of it is destruction. Don't be ashamed of your God. I said, don't be ashamed of your God. It sends the wrong message when you fold and you, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say hallelujah where you could hear it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean for you to catch me praying. No. Now, don't be obnoxious. How many know what I'm talking about? You can go too far the other way. But just be you, right? And be real. And you're not ashamed of what everybody should be doing. I know people, they, they, they have a problem with that. Well, everybody has their different beliefs. If you believe the Bible, you can't believe all that. That's right. hmm? If you're a real Christian, a Christian is a Christian. And the Christ said, nobody comes to the Father except by me. He said, if you don't believe I'm the one, the one, you'll die in your sins. Now, people can say all the stuff they want to say. But if you believe the Bible and you don't want to comfort somebody believing a lie, on being lost, you don't have to be mean about it. But you got what people imagine and you got what is. And God is. And He's real. Hallelujah. And His Word is true. Eternity is real. Life after death is real. Heaven and hell is real. I just don't believe in a God. Who would have a hell? Well, you're just ignorant. You're going to find out. Right? Well, I just believe. Well, you can believe all you want to, but in a few days you're going to quit breathing. And then you're going to find out. I don't think it's going to be much comfort to go, oh, I was wrong. Hmm. I know some of this seems strong, but it either is this way or it is not this way. 
and people just believe in whatever they want to believe, it's not okay. Because life after death is real. Eternity is real. Heaven and earth, heaven and hell is real. God and the devil is real. It's real. What's the beginning? We saw that verse. Look at another verse here. Proverbs 9 and 8. Still talking about the same thing. Why don't people pay attention? Hmm? Don't see it as important. Don't have time for it. While I'm talking about this, are you as glad as I am that you're saved? Oh, my, my, my. You and I could be out somewhere tonight, lost. Is that right? Yes. Just as messed up as anybody else might be, right? It is the mercy of God. It is His grace. Oh, thank God. We don't claim to have arrived, but we ain't lost. <laughs> I said, we're not lost. Somebody said, well, you hope so. No, I know so. We can know so. I'm not lost. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Be kind, but don't comfort people in their lies. Tell people the truth if they want to hear it. This says, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate you. Numerous times in the scriptures it tells not, it tells us don't try to talk to people when they're acting certain ways. Mm-hmm. Don't try to reprove and correct somebody who's, what's a scorner doing? They're despising. They're, belitt- they're showing disrespect. You need to back up. Why? Because this keeps going. They're going to say worse and worse things. They're just going to get in worse shape. They're not in a frame of heart and mind to hear Time to change the subject. Time to back off. But rebuke a wise man and he will hug your neck. (laughs) Why? He has enough respect for God to recognize this is what I needed and it comes in truth and love and thank you very much. Right? Keep reading. Give instruction to a wise man. He'll he'll use it. He'll be yet wiser. Teach a just man. He'll increase in learning. And then he says it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Here he says wisdom. The other place he said knowledge. It's the beginning of both. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and the years of your life shall be increased. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're not just talking theoretical things tonight. We're not just adding to your knowledge. Right now, right where you are, in your chair, at this moment, you begin to respect and reverence God more you'll immediately begin to experience His presence stronger. This is how it works. The reason there's so many people in the world who think there is no God, there's no proof of God to me, who is God? What is There's no proof of God simply because they have no reverence for Him. They don't believe Him in any man at all. They show Him no respect, act like they got here on their own, Act like they're making their self breathe. They're making their heart uh, beat. They're making the world spin around. They're making gravity work. They're making the galaxy work. And, and people have been so rebellious about accepting Him, the reality of Him, they've created other beliefs. Like all of this is self-generated. Self, where did the universe come from? Now, they'll go around the world to tell you, but the bottom line is it just created itself. Out of what? Out of itself. (laughs) From where? 
from itself. That's not science. That's a belief. I said, that's a belief. That's not science. But what it is, is a pitiful attempt to eliminate God. Because if I acknowledge God is real, what comes next? My responsibility <laughs> to my creator. Hmm? And if you want to be rebellious, you don't want to believe that. You want to believe there is no, if there's no God, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's no morals. It's just whatever you decide you want to believe, <laughs> which is pitiful. I'm glad I believe in him. Do you think this belief is going to be vindicated as centuries go by and as, huh, as life goes by? Do you believe what you've read in the back of this book that there's going to come a day when he sits on the great throne? All beings will come before him. And, mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for knowing you. Thank you for knowing you. Thank you for knowing you. Go with me to Mark 7. What's the beginning of knowing anything? Understanding anything? Having any, what, what is the start of it? Reverence, the fear of God, reverence, respect. And yeah, the, the fear in being on the wrong side. <laughs> of him <laughs> being without him you don't have to be terrified of him but if you reject him it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God without not knowing him having rejected him thank God you're not going to find out about that are you me either respect Reverence. He said, those that honor me, what will happen? But those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You treat me like nothing, he said. That's how you're going to be treated. But you show me respect and honor, I'm going to honor you. One of the greatest ways he honors us is with his presence. Huh? Let's see you having a birthday party. And an internationally known person just comes to your party, just shows up. Did they honor you? Yes. Why? Because they just showed up. Didn't have to do a thing. They just showed up. Who's there? It's so and so. So and so? Yeah. Your birthday party? Yep. <laughs> What's the greatest honor we can have? God showing up. Showing up. Is that right? Showing up in our meetings, in our praise, in our offerings, in our messages, right? And oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. When we're saying in our hearts and mind, Lord, you, I worship you. You are, you are real. You are real. I worship you. He that comes to God must believe that he is. And you've got to believe something about his character. He's a rewarder of good, those that diligently seek him. You, you reach up, he's going to reach back. He's going to do something good for you. Brother Oral Roberts, you know, popularized the phrase. Something good is going to happen to you <laughs> today. Huh? <laughs> Brother Hagin, my father in the faith, said, uh, you know, he, he was contemporary of Brother Oral ministering at the same time. And he said he'd go to places and churches and pastors would just be mad about that. They'd go, I wish he'd quit saying that. We're saying what? What? Something good's going to happen to you? Yeah, how does he know? <laughs> he said, Well, is God good or not? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, does he want something good to happen? To you? Well, if you cooperate with him, why wouldn't something good happen to you today? Right. Why, why would a preacher have a problem with that? Darkness. 
Lack of respect. Mark 7, did you find it? Mark 7 and 1. They came to, then came together to him the Pharisees, certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. Now these are the most religious people in the area. When they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that's their, their word, which means unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and, and brazen vessels and of tables. So they were the first church of washing. <laughs> and their key phrase was cleanliness is next to God. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Keep going. The disciples and scribes asked Jesus. They are indignant. Why? Because they noticed they didn't wash. Now when we're talking about washing, it's not just soap and water. It was a specific, one said they washed with a clenched fist and a certain motion and certain, I don't know what it was. This is religious ritual. It's not about germs. And there are no microscopes yet. It's about spiritual whatever they think. Why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashing hands? This is a major problem. Now you're laughing, but it was. It was a major big deal. It's like, this is unacceptable. These people are not of God. This ministry is not right. Why? Because everybody knows if you're of God, you do the wash. You do the hand wash, and you do it when you go, and you do it when you come back, and you do it when you sit down, you do it when you get up, and you do it for the pot, you do it for the plate, you do the wash. And he answered, you know, maybe they're thinking he's going to say, oh, sorry, sorry, we let it slip, we forgot, we will wash, okay? Uh-uh. He said, Isaiah prophesied about you, <laughs> hypocrites. <laughs> it's written, remember this verse? This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They talk God, 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 but they don't know God. And their heart is far from him. Keep going. How be it in vain? Do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the what? The commandments of men. Oh, friends, this is such a major problem that people are rejecting the Word of God because of ideas they got growing up in church, through groups, through denominations, through other things. I was preaching a message some years ago and a lady came up after the service and you could tell she was really unhappy. She said, that's not right, that's not right. And I said, what? And she, she said something, it was the verse. It was a scripture I had just read. I said, what, why do you, why do you say it? She said, because it's just like the song says. I said, the what? She said, you know the song in the hymnal. <laughs> the song. And she quoted some unbelieving verse in an unscriptural song and she's rejecting the scriptures we just read. Now this is not unusual. This is not unusual. Have you ever met anybody that you started talking about the word and they said, well, now I just believe. Huh? No respect for the word. We need to be ready all the time that when the word contradicts something we believe, what happens? We change. 
immediately. We go, well, I'm, I believe that all my life, but it can't be right. Look at there. And that's what it says. If that's what it says, that's what it says. But millions of church going people do not do that, won't do it. You cross one of their traditions, they'll get mad, they'll fight you when you say, well, where's the scripture at? Ah, it's the church. The church is always the church. The church is not God. And men are not God. He said, laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Verse 9, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Why do people not pay attention when the answer is right there? Why? Because they think this is more important than the Word of God. And they assume it is the Word of God. Can't find it anywhere, but yeah, it must be. It's God, yeah. Yeah. One fellow was taking Brother Hagin to task about something one time, and he said, well, where's that? He said, oh, you won't find that in there. But it's right. <laughs> uh. Another fellow told him, we've gone out beyond that. Well, you're too far out from me, brother. <laughs> You've gone on out beyond the Bible. <laughs> that would be laughable if it wasn't so pitiful. <laughs> he said, keep reading. He said, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. I want you to pray it out loud everybody. Everybody in Branson, everybody watching online, say it out loud like you mean it. Father God, Father God help, me help me not to do that. Not to do that. In Jesus' name, help me not to do that. Help me to see it. Say it further. Say, help me to discern between men's ideas, religious tradition, and your holy word. And not respect traditions like it's the word. And not treat your word like it's the ideas of men. Keep reading, verse 10. Moses said, honor your father and mother. Whoever curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, they, have, they changed it. If a man shall say to his father or mother, it's korban, means dedicated. That's to say a gift, a gift to God. By whatever you might be profited by me, he shall be free. He, he, Jesus translated honoring your father and mother as doing things for them financially and materially. And they had come up with a way around that to say, yeah, but everything I have is dedicated to God. So that don't apply anymore. <laughs> verse, th verse 12, you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you've delivered and many, he said this is just one example, many such like things you do. Friends, this is not something that just happened centuries ago. How many have been around church and people, church people enough to know? I'm telling you, it's with us all over the place. People got their formulas, they got their concepts, they got their ideas and it's what mama believed, and it's what grandma believed, and it's what, you know, our pastors preached. And where's it at? Where's the scripture? <laughs> Friends, I want to challenge you. Ask questions in yourself. Don't, don't be combative with people, but when you hear something, do not, I don't care who's saying it. I don't care if it's me saying it. I don't care who's saying it. Where's the scripture? Come on, help me out. I want to hear you say it. Where's the scripture? Where's the scripture? Where is it? The Lord did this with me the first, uh, first couple of months I went to school at Ramah. 
He knew I needed it. Still do. I was hearing some things I'd never heard before. I'm learning. I'm excited. And the Lord said to me in a time of prayer, I don't mean an audible voice, but inside, He said, Keith, examine everything you believe. Find it in the Word. I knew it was Him. He said, everything. When you, when you realize, I believe this, okay, where is it? Where's it at? So, it wasn't the very next day. Something came up. I thought, yeah, I believe that. Okay, where is it at? Maybe I didn't have time to look it up right then, but I'd write it down. And when I got home to the apartment, I'd start looking for it. This went on month after month and year after year. And I see why he said it. So much stuff I believed I thought was right. Some of the things, yeah, you find it pretty quick. And you think, yep, yep, that's it. That's right. And now you're stronger than ever in what you believe. There were some other things. I thought, oh, yeah, 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 that's in the Bible. Where? Where's it at? I looked, couldn't find it. I looked. Well, I know it's in there. I'm just missing it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> After weeks, not one, found several verses that contradicted it. <laughs> and yet I was sure. What was it? A tradition mm-hmm. of men. Mm-hmm. One thing I heard, a, I heard a preacher preach when I was a boy. Another thing I heard my granddaddy say. Mm-hmm. He always said it. Well, such and such and such and such. Mm-hmm. Don't make it a verse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doesn't make it a verse. Help me out. Where's, where's the scripture? First Peter 1. He said, for as much as you know. Do we know? That you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, that means lifestyle, received by what? Tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Read this in the Amplified, please. Verse 18. Verse 18 Amplified. You must know and recognize that you were redeemed from the useless way of living inherited by tradition from your forefathers. What have, we, what have we been redeemed from? Not just the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from living a wasted life by believing men's ideas about God. And that's something we ought to shout about the rest of the year and into the new. Hmm? Because there are millions who their religion is taking them away from God. And they'd fight you over it. Some of them would die over it. Got not one verse to back it up and 20 to contradict it, but this is what they believe. I believe what I believe. You got a right to your beliefs. I got a right to my beliefs. Actually, you don't. If Jesus is your Lord, you don't have a right to just make up what you want to believe. You believe what he told you to believe. Amen. Right? You believe his word. Yes. You don't just make up stuff as you go along. Right. <laughs> Somebody say, I know. I know. I've, been redeemed I've been redeemed from the useless, from the useless fruitless, fruitless way, of way of living inherited by tradition. From my forefathers. How are you redeemed? We've been redeemed, verse 19, by the precious blood of the Christ, the Lamb, without blemish, without spot. Oh, hallelujah. Can anybody say, I've been delivered? Have you? Can you say, I've been delivered from some junk? I've been delivered from believing stuff that just boxed me up in bondage and When Phyllis and I first started getting uh, serious about serving the Lord, we'd been married, I don't know, two months, three months. And thank God, by the mercy of God, we went to a little church. And and, um, she got, you heard testimony, she got filled with the Spirit and I didn't. And, and, um, well, we got some friends that were about our age and we'd we'd hang out after service. and, and, And they were dyed in the wool, their group and denomination, 
And that's all we knew too. This was before we found anything out about Brother Hagen or Brother Copeland or any of that kind of thing. And um, so we'd go to church and then we'd go out afterwards and so to our house or their house and have sandwiches and we were good friends. And uh, as time went on, they kept trying to adhere to the rules that were very strict in this group, in this denomination. And good-hearted guy and a good-hearted woman. And they, it was pressure to them and, and they were coming short of it. And, and as the months went by, it wore them down. And they decided, you know, we, we begin to get some things from the Word about faith and being redeemed, so we started going two different directions. We begin to get free. Anybody have been set free by the Word of God? Yeah. We begin to get free, get free. They didn't go with us on it. They didn't want to hear cassette tapes of preaching. <laughs> they didn't want to go to a Copeland meeting. That was contrary to their traditional beliefs. And so we, after a while, lost touch. and Eventually, not long after that, we left the state and went to Brother Hagin's ministry and school and all that. Well, what happened within just the next two or three years? They eventually quit going to church at all. And then their marriage failed. And I don't, I don't, I lost track. I don't know what happened, but I know it was sad. It was painful to hear. It was painful to watch. And I know what happened. They could, they could, they felt like they couldn't live what was, they were being told was the way to live and truth. They, they, they did it for a while. They thought, but it wasn't working. And it was just kept getting harder and harder. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because it wasn't, it wasn't the Word of God. I said it wasn't the Word of God. It was men's ideas about being holy. It was men's ideas about pleasing God. Hmm? And, and they believed if you, if you come short of some of it, well, you had to go get saved again. And after months of that and years of that, they, the enemy convinced them, you can't do this. And they believed it. And so they just quit. And then they quit each other. That's sad. That's what you've been redeemed from. Amen. Confusion, darkness, burdens, now, I'm not saying go out and see how worldly you can be. If you love God and you draw closer to Him, you'll be holy like He's holy. But it won't be because you're trying to adhere to somebody's list. It's because you're walking with Him and He's showing you things. Amen. Say it out loud, thank God. Thank God. Stand up on your feet, say it out loud, thank God. For, thank you, Lord, for redeeming me from worthless traditions. Thank you. 